Uh, my name is Alex, and I'm a recruitment advisor, and I'd like to welcome everybody today to this webinar dedicated to the Master of Finance Toronto program offered by the Smith School of Business at Queen's University. So before we get started with the session today, we here at Queen's University think it's very important to begin these sessions with a land acknowledgement. So we would like to acknowledge that Smith Toronto is situated on the traditional territory of the Huron Wendat, the Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. We're grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. So on behalf of Gary Hines, who's the Associate Director of the Master of Finance Program, I'd like to welcome everybody on the call today. Typically, Gary leads these sessions, but Gary wasn't available today. So standing in for Gary is going to be myself, Alex, and my colleague, Jen Mayer, and we are the recruitment team for the program. So we're going to run through a few quick slides about the program uh, details, program content, program information, and then we're going to focus today a little bit more on the application side, which is our specialty. So we're going to leave some dedicated time to talk about application tips and tricks and also answer any questions you may have. So with that said, let's just quickly go over the agenda for today. So as I mentioned, uh, we'll do quick introductions to Jen and myself, just so you know who we are and what we do. We'll do a brief program interview, program overview, and then we'll focus today on sort of the application side. So we're doing application tips, application tricks, some suggestions from Jen and myself, uh, some FAQs, so some frequently asked questions that we get by applicants to the program. And then we'll leave some time at the end to dedicate to the Q&A. So you do, should see the Q&A function enabled on your screen there. So you can go ahead and type some questions into the Q&A as we go. Or if you'd like, you can wait till the end and we'll leave some dedicated time there as well. Um, final piece of housekeeping, the session is being recorded today and our wonderful webinar host is Liz McKittrick. So Liz will be ensuring that everybody who registered today, whether you were able to attend or not, does receive an email within the next few business days with a link to the recording. And that being said, we do record all these sessions and we post them on our Smith YouTube channel, the MFIN Toronto playlist. So I'll put the link to that at the end of the session today. But if you did want to uh, watch a, a, a typical information session led by Gary covering uh, a more deeper dive into program content, you can do that at any time. Just head to YouTube, go to the Smith channel, look up the uh, Master of Finance Toronto playlist, and you'll see a, a whole host of past recorded webinars there. You can watch them at your leisure. So as I mentioned, my name is Alex Yelland and I am the recruitment advisor for the program. So my role is really to work with people before they've started the formal application process. So uh, answering any questions they may have, providing them information about the program, helping them to determine their el eligibility, reviewing their resume and their transcript copies, advising them on which program may be the best fit for them. And then when they decide they're ready, then I help them initiate the application process. And um, my colleague, Jen Mayer is also with us. So Jen's gonna hop on and give a brief introduction. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everyone. So uh, my name is Jen Mayer. I'm an advisor for the Masters of Finance program. So if you decide to move forward and start your application, you'll be working with me one-on-one uh, -on -one to, to pull everything together. So my job essentially is to advocate for you to build the strongest application to present to the admissions committee. So we're really working very closely together to uh, answer any questions you have, set up a Zoom call, phone call, um, and just sort of giving you that one-on-one -on -one touch just to ensure that all your answers are, um, sorry, all your questions are answered and, and to ensure that the program's a good fit for you as well. Perfect, thanks, Jen. Thanks for the introduction. So a couple of brief slides to cover some of the program basics and then we'll focus on the application side of things. So in terms of delivery format, the program is taught in person at Smith Toronto, which is at 200 Simcoe Street, right at downtown Toronto, just about a block from Union Station. So all your regular weekly classes will be held there at Smith Toronto, they'll be taught in person. Uh, the class, uh, the program runs for 12 months, so it starts once each year in June. So we're just finalizing the class for this upcoming June intake, and we're starting to look ahead to next June and uh, recruit for that class as well. Uh, you can find the schedule on the website. It's typically one or two weekday evening classes and then an alternating weekend full day class. So typically you'll be doing two classes at a time during the course of the program. So on those Saturday classes, you'd have a full day class, but that would be two separate classes. So you'd have a morning session with one professor, a little break, and then you have an afternoon session with the second professor. Um, uh, there's also some on-site sessions, which I'll mention later on in the, in the program, where you'll come onto campus and be a full-time student during those sessions. And then there's also career supports and coaching uh, offered through our Career Advancement Center, which I'll also speak to a bit more detail later on. 
In terms of the curriculum, we've got some core courses for the program and a few elective options. So these are the core courses, the eight core courses listed there on the screen. You can see the cover topics from corporate finance through to quantitative analysis, equity markets, portfolio management, and communication. Communication is a big part of uh, being a team leader and being a leader in your field. So this is a business degree offered by a business school. So we will be doing a lot of business leadership and communication skill building in addition to the core finance uh, classes that you'll be taking derivatives. I should mention this is a very practical program. So it provides a lot of opportunities for hands-on practical projects, both through the curriculum itself, practical projects you'll be working on in your classes, but also a lot of experiential opportunities to get involved in extracurricular opportunities. So there'll be case competitions. There's the co-op, which is the alternative asset fund run by students. Um, and there's a number of other, there's CFA workshops, there's optional workshops offered throughout the program. So it really is designed to be a very practical hands-on program. It's also a team-based program. So you'll be on a team of six to eight students during the program. So a lot of your coursework will be team-based projects. So that's another way that uh, we encourage uh, professors to really leverage that team-based nature to design the curriculum based around very practical hands-on projects that allow you to take what you've learned in the theoretical side and really apply it in real world uh, circumstances. And of course, to also bring your own background, your own education and professional experience to the, those learnings. In terms of those electives that I mentioned, you can see you get to choose two. So these electives do change a little bit, but typically they're, we try to keep them relatively consistent year over year. So the current electives we have would be a FinTech elective, Financial Technovation and Innovation, technol sorry, Technology and Innovation, it's hard to say. Andrew doing alternative investments, investment banking, AI, of course, is a big topic. So we have an AI and finance course, which is very popular, and sustainable finance course. So you'll be able to pick two of those, and the final portion of the year will be dedicated to completing those two elective courses. So I quickly mentioned the on-site session. So the kickoff session uh, in June will be at the Kingston campus, Queen's University. Um, so this June, we're just gearing up to welcome the class here on campus in June. So it's a week-long session where you'll come on campus, you'll be a full-time student during that session. So if you wanna take a quick look at sort of a brief schedule for what it looks like, people often wonder what those on-site sessions look like. You can see it's quite a full-time schedule with lots of classes, but also lots of great food, lots of additional activities and evening activities. And so it's really a chance for you to get to meet your classmates in person, um, get to experience Queens campus, be a full-time student, meet your professors, and really have that full-time student experience to kick off the program. So it is mandatory attendance. You really need students to be able to be there for the full week since you will be doing a significant amount of coursework during that week. Um, so you'd be able to, you need to sort of be able to book that off as if it were vacation or holiday time or requested time off and come on campus to really enjoy that experience. So that's the core one week onsite session to kick off the program. And then we'll have a second shorter session, just a three day session in December. And that session's held in Toronto at Smith Toronto. In terms of the career supports that I mentioned, so a lot of those are offered through our Career Advancement Centers. So that's a wonderful career support resource. So they'll meet with the entire class uh, during that, typically during that week-long on-site session. They'll meet with the class, they'll take a poll to see which industries are represented, what the interests of the current class are, what the profile looks like. And then they'll uh, send some surveys to you to fill out so they can tailor networking events towards your needs, towards what you're looking for. And beyond those sort of group uh, sessions and the group networking uh, activities, they also offer one-on-one -on -one sessions. So they can do one-on-one -on -one sessions with you for career strategy and planning, career direction, job search strategies, salary negotiate, negotiation. They can help you with your resume, interview prep, uh, and a variety of other, uh, of other supports offered through the CAC. So I always recommend to students, don't wait until it's too late. Don't start thinking about the career supports at the end of the program. Get started, book your first session with the CAC early on in the program. So you can start that relationship with them, see what supports are available, and then work with them throughout the duration of the year so that by the time you're ready to graduate, you're really well advanced in your, in your post-graduation career uh, strategy. In terms of the current class profile, you'll see it listed on the screen. So a class of about 54 students, average age tends to be about early 30s with average number of work experience around seven years, I'd say five to seven years. You'll see a significant number of students have completed CFA level one prior to the start of the program with some also having completed level two and some are full charter holders already. It is, the program is uh, open to international students. So you'll see a, a breakdown of the different uh, international backgrounds that we have students and industries represented in the program. 
and the male to female ratio is there, as well as the domestic and international uh, ratio is on the screen there. In terms of uh, program fees, you'll see the fees for both domestic and international students listed on the screen. Those are also available on the website. You can check those fees at any time. Those fees are typically paid out in three installments over the course of the year. So you'll pay initial, an initial deposit. If you're offered a seat in the program, you'll pay a deposit to hold that seat at the time of accepting your offer. And then you'll pay the bulk of those, the rest, uh, the remainder of those program fees, typically in three installments over the course of the 12 month program. Um, those fees are all inclusive. So they include tuition, the course, cost of all your learning materials, books, online licenses, uh, meals and accommodations. So all costs for those on-site sessions are included in those fees, uh, costs for the case competitions. The only additional cost you may incur is just your transportation to and from Kingston for that first on-site session, but all the other costs are, are wrapped up in those program fees. Okay, so with that, I'll hand things over to Jen for a quick uh, look at the application process. And then Jen and I will uh, both be on the screen towards the end and we'll uh, do some application tips and tricks with you. Thanks again, Alex. So if you decide that you do want to start your application, typically what we would do is um, we start with what's called a preliminary assessment. So we start by looking at your academic and your professional background. Um, to determine whether or not you uh, even qualify for the program. However, I always say to, to people, if you even are just curious to know where you stand, you don't have to start a formal application. I'm happy to work with you and to um, take a look at your background to see if it, you know, that this would be a possible fit. And, and maybe it's not a good fit for now, but maybe it's, you know, having a conversation around it, um, obtaining a couple more years of work experience or whatever it might be to put you in the position to be a strong candidate for the program. Um, so in terms of admission, so we are typically looking for, um, an, a completion of an undergraduate degree along with two years of relevant work experience, um, as well. In addition to that successful completion of a GMAT. So usually I would say if we're looking about a score, we've got a 580 and higher. Sometimes if you do come below that, we can, um, you know, depending on your background, if you've got other sort of um, accreditations or you've got strong work experience, we might be able to work with that score. Um, a GRE score is also acceptable uh, as well as the CFA level one, two or three, of course. Uh, we do look for two references. I typically would say, you know, suggest uh, one from a colleague and one from a superior. So somebody who you work within a team with because the program is a bit team-based and then someone who you report to directly. So these uh, references are very straightforward. We don't ask for much more than five or 10 minutes of their time because we know they are busy working professionals. So you just provide me with their name and email and I send them an electronic uh, reference to complete and then it generates back into your file. Um, of course, we need to see a copy of a resume to see what uh, your past and current work experience looks like. Um, in addition to that, you know, like other sort of things you might have been involved in that will help strengthen your application. Uh, a cover letter. And then once everything is in, you'll have an interview with Gary Hines, who's the associate director of the program. It's typically via Zoom, uh, about 30 minutes in length. And at that point, because we've got a good idea of your background, um, it's, it's more of a conversation around fit to ensure that we're going to meet one another's expectations and that we're going to be able to deliver you what you're uh, looking for in the program. And then as well that you'll be able to bring something to the program. Um, you know, as we always say that you'll learn just as much from, from your, your classmates as well in the program. Um, so yeah, so we can move on now to some application tips. So these are sort of things that I was, I'm, you know, we're working together that I'm going to be providing you along the way to just strengthen your application that little bit more. Um, so to start off, it, it doesn't take long to complete your application. So maybe one to two weeks, um, to get everything in. And I will, uh, I will stay in touch with you to ensure that, you know, we try to meet that, that time frame. It also looks you know, um, desirable to the admissions committee because it's, it's showing that you have initiative and that you've got the drive to pull things together um, in a timely manner and, um, and then have that interview with the committee. Yeah, I agree. Um, and um, in terms of the application documents, Jen, uh, are there any documents that you think people could uh, speed up their application process by preparing ahead of time? 
I would say for those who are international, for just about every one of our programs, like I was starting the WES assessment, that which can take a little bit of time, like getting um, started on that will really help sort of minimize the amount of time it's going to take you to complete your file. So that's for people who have completed their degree outside of North America. Um, what about in terms of the resume and cover letter? Do you have any tips for, or do people often ask you for tips on ways to strengthen their resume and cover letter? Yeah. So in regards to the resume, I would typically suggest include anything that's finance related, whether it's internship or voluntary experience, anything like that at all that you have that would be sort of, you know, would, would make sense for this program. I would include that in there because, um, you know, it shows that you are interested in many other ways other than just simply going forward and getting this degree. It shows um, that desire around finance industry as well. And uh, in regards to the cover letter, what I would suggest is uh, it's sort of an opportunity for you to express your interest for the program, like what you hope to get out of the program, what you'll bring to the program, um, and such things as that. It's typically very much uh, like a, a cover letter that you would use to apply to a job that you're apply, um, to apply to a job. <laughs> and uh, same format and, and such as well. Uh, in terms of the resume, sometimes people ask me how long it can be. Is there any requirement to keep it to one page or is a two, three page resume acceptable? Um, I would usually say like, don't exceed two pages unless, you know, it, unless you have to, that's, that's fine. But, you know, the committee is reviewing a lot of applications, a lot of um, resumes. So, you know, if, the, if you're able to highlight key things, you know, um, and keep it to two pages, that's, that's ideal. Awesome. In terms of references, people often ask, uh, do they need to be academic references or can they be professional references? And do they have to write a reference letter or how does that work? So what can you right, tell people about that process? Jen? Yeah, that's a good question. So it really sort of depends on where you are within your career too. So for example, if you've you know, only been working for a couple of years um, and maybe you know have, have had a job or two. I would then suggest maybe you know an academic one academic reference and then one professional reference. If you've been in the industry for you know five, 10, 15 years, then absolutely two professional references are going to go a long way. Um, usually, you know, some people say, well, you know, if they've only been in within a role for you know six months. Can I use a past um reference colleague or professional? And absolutely, like I. I would say ultimately the I would select the person who can best speak to your your skills and abilities when it comes to identifying who you want that reference to be. In terms of information, there's a lot of great information about the program on the program website. And I always think it looks good on applicants to show that they've done their research. They've spent some time researching the program website. So they're familiar with the basics of the program and, and they kind of can help them decide if it's a, a good fit for them in addition to the, the advice that we can give them. And I think the same goes for prepping for the interview. Like it's really good to show the director during the interview that you're really well familiar with the program. You've looked at the curriculum, you've looked at those course descriptions and you have some good questions that aren't uh, easily answered on the website. Jen, do you have any other tips for people in terms of prepping for that interview with the program director? Alex, I would say that you were right on the money in the sense of like, you know, know the schedule, know the program fees, um, it's sort of the, the basics, because, you know, if the if the director's asking you and a question comes up around, you know, like, oh, the, the June start and you're thinking, oh, shoot, I thought it was September. That's going to show them right there that you maybe haven't done enough research yet. And it might be concerning to them to know to whether or not you're actually prepared enough for this program and ready for it and how committed you are to the program. And I also like to remind people that like the interview is really a chance for the director to get to meet you and learn a bit more about you. So it's not something you need to be scared about or, or nervous about. It's a chance for you to meet the director and for the director to meet you. And really at the end of the day, what the director wants and what we all want is our students to be successful, right? We want them to be successful during the program, to succeed academically, uh, and to succeed after the program, to go on and have great careers. So that's what the sort of the whole application process is designed to do is to help, uh, you know, encourage a successful applicant who's going to become a successful student and a successful graduate. So everybody's sort of on your side. We want you to make sure it's the right fit for you. And that's sort of a big part of the application process and certainly the interview process with the director, I think. Um, before we go on to the frequently asked questions, we do have a question that came in, in the Q&A, which is great. So maybe I'll read it and then we'll see what Jen thinks about it. 
So an anonymous attendee asked, what kind of undergrad degrees are you looking for? Specifically, do you accept three-year non-business degrees? And it's a tricky question. What would you say, Jen? So typically, yes, we would like to see that you've done a business degree because it's this is a master level program. So, you know, we want to ensure that, you know, you're going to have some sort of um, knowledge within that area. However, for example, if say you do have a degree that is outside of business, but you've completed the CFA level one, that alone there is going to tell us, okay, because the CFA is very, very rigorous, very difficult to pass, that you've got um, sort of the horsepower to make it through the program. Um, if you were able to do the CFA level one, it wouldn't be the ultimate determination like having the CFA level one, but if you do um, I would say still have a conversation if you're wondering, like still let us have a review. You know, we can have a conversation around like what else you've done. Um, we do accept uh, some three year degrees. Again, it would depend on where that was completed, what it was, the degree was in. Um, and we'd have to have confirmation from the admissions committee as well. Yeah, and I would second that. I think there's always a little bit of wiggle room. It's always usually a conversation with the admissions committee when they're reviewing your files. So we certainly have sort of typical norms and standards, but there's always a bit of room for, for a decision on a case-by-case -case basis. So um, always best just to get in touch with us, let us review your documents so we can advise you further. But thanks very much for sending in that question. If anybody else does have questions, then just go free to feel free to just pop them in as we go. Uh, and in the meantime, we'll look at some FAQs, some frequently asked questions that Jed and I get as members of the recruitment team. So first question, how do I determine if I'm eligible for the program? It's a pretty common question we get. Jen, what would you say? Reach out to Alex or I. You know, all we would need to see is simply just a copy of your resume, even if you don't have on hand a copy of your um, unofficial transcripts. Uh, reach out to us. We can always schedule a call, as I mentioned, a Zoom call, have a look at your um, your professional and academic background if, if possible, and then provide you with uh, our feedback around your eligibility for the program. Yeah, and that kind of ties into the second frequently asked question, how do I start the application process? The easiest way is on the website. Visit the program website, you'll see the online application form, complete that application form, ideally upload a copy of your resume and your unofficial transcript when you do, and we'll receive that form. And once re we'll receive it, Jen will have a chance to look at the form, look at your resume and your transcript, and she'll get in touch with you with your preliminary assessment feedback. So that's the easiest way. Another way is if you get in touch with me through one of the other forms on the website, we've got a variety of ways, like a contact us form. You can introduce yourself there. You can request a virtual one-on-one -on -one with me. So that's another way. Fill out one of the other forms, get in touch with me, and then I can help facilitate uh, connecting you with Jen for that preliminary assessment as well. Uh, so question number three, what are the application deadlines? Are there benefits to applying early? Jen, what would you say? Yes. So at this point, uh, we do not have application deadlines. I mean, that could change, but right now we do not. We simply have a certain amount of seats in each uh, class that we that we fill. Um, so is there a benefit to applying early? Absolutely. You're able to secure your spot in that program. Uh, not only that, but it's it's also you know a great idea to you know it's you're going to be adding on a master program in into your your everyday. So it's going to be you know we're going to have conversations with your family and with your employer, whoever else might be impacted by this, uh, as well as getting financing in order and maybe you need a visa or whatnot. So there's a number of different things. So even though you know you some people do sort of procrastinate, but the sooner you get it done, the sooner you can sign up, sort of get, like, get the rest of the sort of pieces in place before the program starts. And as well, there is usually some like pre-program uh, type of readings or uh, I'm not sure assignments, but just some, some things that we do provide to the students to prepare them for the program. So that once it begins, they're sort of feeling like everybody's up to par and ready to, to start the program. So absolutely, I would say if you are thinking about starting the program, um, either this June, which is, we're getting very close. So it would be a very quick turnaround if you do. We do still have a couple spots, um, but for next year, I mean, even though it's a year away, I would absolutely say start your application now. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And I think it ties into question to frequently asked question number four, how long does the application process typically take? It really depends largely on you. It depends on how quickly we can get your documents together and complete your application files. So as Jen said, if you're ready to go and you have those documents prepared ahead of time or you're able to get them to us quickly, 
then the application process can move quite quickly. Um, but if it takes longer, then it takes longer. So it can go anywhere from a few days, if it's really fast, to a few weeks, to you know a few months in some cases. So prepare ahead of time, get those documents ready, and you can complete an, a quicker application. Uh, we do have another question that came in from the Q&A, so maybe we'll just jump over there for a sec. So this question is about scholarship. So Tanuj asked, what is the parameter for scholarships? So in terms of scholarships for the program, we do have some entrance scholarships. Um, they're merit-based, so they're typically given for smaller amounts, I would say two to five thousand dollar range um, and they're based on merit the overall strength of your application profile so when the admissions committee is reviewing your application deciding to make you an offer of admissions to the program that's typically when they decide if they also want to offer you an entrance scholarship so they're merit based based on the overall strength of, of your application and given for smaller amounts uh, we have scholarships for black and indigenous students valued at ten thousand dollars each those do require an additional essay submission so if you're interested in applying for those Jan and can help provide you some information on that during the application process. Additional funding, I guess the ProSAP program is OSAP eligible for Ontario-based residents as well, so that's a benefit. And for international students, uh, we also have a contact at RBC who can help facilitate like a student line of credit through the bank. And for international students, we recommend Empower is a good source to look into for international student loans. And of course, uh, you would get a tuition tax credit for those who are paying uh, domestic tuition. Um, and some people are able to leverage their RSPs as well um, if they're uh, Canadian based. So that's typically some of the funding options available. I'm not sure, Jen, if you had anything to add there. No, I think you I think you did well uh, with all that, Alex. I think you've covered everything. The second part of the question, I'm not sure it says, is the course eligible for federal student role? I'm not sure what the federal student role refers to. Have you heard of that, Jen? I have not, no. Okay, so that's one where we're not quite sure what that means. Um, typically, if it's something that is related to immigration, for example, the OINP program, how many points am I going to get on the program on that program from doing the program or or something immigration related, we typically recommend people to get in touch with QUIC, which is our international center. They have a team of uh, registered international student advisors who are really experts and they're the best ones to give advice on more specific uh, questions related to anything sort of with the government, with immigration uh, side of things. So we do have resources there to help you with in addition to doing your own research and reaching out to those agents yourself. Okay, and so, so Tanush has clarified the question, is the course uh, for federal student loans they have zero interest loans. Huh. Uh, again, I haven't heard about this specifically. I'm not sure if you have, Jen. No, I have not. No, this is new to me. Okay, so Tanuj, that's a great question. That's one that we may have to take offline and do a bit of research on. And uh, we'll put our email addresses on the screen after this slide. So you'll be able to reach out to us by email and we can do some research on that and follow up with you. Some of these things we do need to uh, follow up by email just because there's we know so much, but we don't know everything. And so sometimes we need to check with the relevant people in our department or outside of our department to get an answer. So that's a great question. Um, so returning to the FAQs, uh, number five, is there a minimum GPA requirement? That's a question we get often. Jen, what do you usually tell people? I would say 2.5 if I had to say, like, if there was a hard 2.5. However, we do take a holistic approach. So, I mean, if you're, if you have a, say, a 2.0 GPA, but then you've written the GMAT, you've got a strong, strong score, and maybe you've done some other certificates or other such things um, that would help offset that. So it's sort of a case by case, but I would say that we typically like to see a minimum of a 2.5. Um, so in terms of work experience, we usually say on the website, a minimum of two years, and we often get people asking, can people with less than two years experience be uh, eligible? So for example, sometimes people have done some co-ops or internships while they were still a student. Um, so Jen, is that a possibility? Do we look at that type of experience as well? We do. We, we, we absolutely do. We do take into consideration because most of the time it's like when you're doing the internship, it's, if it's within a finance related role, it's still experience that you're gaining at that time. So yes, we would certainly, so that's why, again, you know, going back to what to include in the resume, like ensure you're including all of that stuff on there. 
Yeah, and I think that ties into the next one about additional courses, diplomas, certificates. Do those help to strengthen your application profile? Certainly, they certainly do. Can I send you copies of my additional uh, transcripts from these additional courses I've done or certificates or diplomas I've done? Certainly you can. Send them to us, we'll add them to your profile. It all goes together to complete your profile. But that unofficial, uh, the or sorry, the unofficial transcript to get started and the official transcript of the West for international degrees, we will need that undergrad transcript as well. That is a core required document, but additional transcripts are definitely welcome. Um, so we already covered the on-site sessions and that they are mandatory, so we'll skip over that one. Uh, and just two more, and then we'll turn it over to you, and then we'll wrap things up and let you get on with your day. So uh, question number nine, how many hours per week is a typical time commitment? That's a question that we get pretty often. Jen, what do you usually tell people? I usually typically say 20 to 25 hours you'll be allocating towards the program and that that does include the class time that is the one evening and the weekend so saying typical and on average it can vary so I mean some weeks you might be putting less time towards and some some weeks you might be putting more time towards it so aside from those class days you will I would say if you break it down two hours two to three hours a day be putting towards the program, whether it's working on projects or readings, um, assignments, et cetera. Um, and keep in mind too, that that time you might even have like team meetings with your team. Um, so yeah, I would say 20 to 25 hours you can expect to, to allocate towards the program. Yeah, and I would just add on that typically people ask like, is it gonna be overwhelming? Am I gonna be so busy? I have a full-time job, I have a family. So we understand that we don't want you to be overwhelmed. So I would say the course is designed to be manageable, but it will be a busy year. So typically students tell us like expect to be busy, but you're not gonna be overwhelmed. And sort of after the first, let's say several weeks or month, once you've kind of met your teammates, you've synced your calendars, you've sort of developed a weekly or monthly schedule, then after that, the rest of the year can run relatively smoothly. So it's just the initial phase of kind of getting everybody synced up and deciding when you're gonna to meet to work on those projects and getting your own kind of ske weekly schedule and rhythm going and then after that the rest of the year uh, is relatively straightforward for people but it, it will be a busy year so do expect to be busy and certainly you know talk to your family talk to your employer make sure you have that support it's an important piece of being successful in the program as well okay final question and we'll turn it over to you for the q a um, is the program considered full-time? Yes, it's considered a full-time program and it confers a full master's degree from Queen's University. And for international students, are they eligible? Yes, this program does accept international students. And so it does allow international students to apply for a student visa and a postgraduate work permit. And some good news on the postgraduate work permit, the Ontario government has recently increased the typical length. So typically for a 12 month program, the government has decided to grant a three year postgraduate work permit now for 12 month programs. So that's great news. Hopefully that remains in place. It always remains to be seen with the government. They uh, tend to change these things from time to time, but currently um, that's the change they made, which is great news for international applicants. I would say if you are an international applicant, it's even more important to get your application started as early as possible possible, since we do have sort of a limit on how many international students we can take in any given class. And also you need to allow yourself time to do that visa processing. So getting started as early as possible if you're an international applicant is really key to a successful application. Okay, so as I mentioned, there's the email contacts for both myself and Jen on the screen. So if you had any questions that you uh, didn't wanna ask us today on the call, please feel free to send either of us an email after this call, we can follow up with you. Uh, there's a link to the program website and a QR code for the application form. And there's the link for the YouTube playlist. So again, our apologies today that Gary wasn't able to join and lead the typical info session. So if you did want to uh, cover that material that we typically do cover in the information session, which is a deeper dive into the program, then please just visit the YouTube channel and you'll be able to watch past recordings and see all that, get all that information there as well. So we got another question here from anonymous attendee. Um, is pursuing the CFA along with this course, with this course, along with a full time job possible, or is it an overly ambitious target? Oh, that's a great question, Jen. What do you think about that? Would be trying to complete CFA while doing the program overly ambitious? I don't think so. Only because, for example, when you're in the program. 
we do offer the workshops for CFA level two, CFA level three. So it is, you know, as Alex mentioned, like you're adding another thing on top of your job, your family, you're, got, you're doing your master's. So it is going to be busy. It's, you know what, there's, it's, it's, it's short term. So I think it's doable for sure. If it was, you know, going to be three years of this, uh, you might be exhausted by that time, but yes, it's doable. You're going to be busy, but it's going to be worth it. Yeah. And I think that's really important to highlight. There are these optional CFA level two and level three workshops that students in the program are able to take. They're not mandatory, but they're optional if you wanted to do those and they're sort of week long prep courses. Um, so we certainly would get a lot of students who decide to do those and maybe they've done CFA one and they want to do two or three while they're doing the program. So that's certainly part of it. And there's a lot of other experiential uh, optional elements to the program. So I really think it really depends on you. How much do you want to take on your plate? And uh, probably the easiest recommendation would be to, you know, get started in the program, get set up, get your rhythm set up, and then decide how much you want to take on and then sort of be a little bit flexible with yourself. If you find yourself getting overwhelmed, say, okay, maybe I'm going to step back a bit. And if you find that, oh, I got less more time than I thought, I want to get more involved, then get more involved because I think the practical side of the program is really beneficial and it takes what you learned in theory in CFA and puts it into practice, which is a really essential uh, piece of the program. Another great question here. here. Oh, sorry, Jen, did you want to say something? No. Okay, another great question here uh, for the work experience requirement. What specific finance experience are you looking for? For example, uh, would a more back-end support role qualify, or are you looking for specific credit finance analysis experience? So with someone who has maybe been working more in the back-end in, in a finance office, be with that type of experience qual still qualify for the program, or do they do need to be really doing like hardcore finance credit analytics? What do you, what do you think, Jen? I don't think necessarily you need to be like, if you're working in the back end, I would, I would sort of want to know more information. Again, it goes back to having a conversation with us and, and uh, just having a better understanding of what your day-to-day -day looks like in terms like within that role. Like, um, so again, this might be more uh, sort of a one-on-one -on -one conversation to have, but uh, it's, it's diverse in the sense of like those that we do take in with a finance background. So yeah, um, you know, again, I'd be happy to have a conversation and have a review of your profile, if that's the case. Yeah, and I think we do. The program is certainly open to people from a diverse uh, array of, of finance backgrounds. So um, that's just one piece of your overall application profile, right, is your work experience. But we'd also want to look at your transcript and see your educational and any extracurriculars. And I'd say it's also like the application process is a chance for you to pitch your case and try to convince the admissions committee that you think you'd be great in the program. So it's also, you know, a conversation, right? It's a chance for you to say, hey, I've been working in the back end, but I really want to move into this role. And that's what I want to do. That's why I, I want to do this program. I'm hoping this program can get me where I want to go. And so in that case, it's just a chance for you to explain your motivations, explain where you want, hope to go and how you hope this program will get there. And that's certainly a big part of what the program is for, is people looking to advance their career, whether they want to pivot, whether they want to move up, whether they want to get into that leadership management role that they've been had their eye on for a while. So it's just ultimately a question of, of you sort of being able to articulate that and convince the admissions committee that you think you'd be a great, a great student in the program. Okay, so we've cleared out the queue, so we'll just give it a couple seconds just to see if anyone has any last minute questions and then we'll let uh, let you go. But in the interim, yeah, I'd like to just thank everyone again uh, for registering for the session. And um, yeah, if you weren't able to attend today, keep your eye out on your email inbox for, for a link to the recording within the next few business days. And feel free to reach out to Jen and I by email in the interim with any other questions that may arise. Okay, I don't see any final questions, so we'll leave it there. So thanks again for joining us today. Thanks, Jen, so much for your great insights. Yes, oh, my pleasure. And thank you again, everybody, for your time. And hopefully we hear from you. And if, even if it's just simply to have a conversation, uh, looking forward to chat with you. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you again soon, hopefully.